have you choose, you can choose two of the cards up on this board here. Any well, one? In the spirit of, uh, thank you first of all, thank you for yes. the honor. I didn't know it was the first one. I feel yes. so honored. There should be a plaque here or something. <laughs> uh, or maybe that was really for me, not for the editorial. Uh, <laughs> but I want to challenge and I want to double down. Double down. And I actually hope, do you have slides? Yes or no? Uh, yes. First yeah. Okay. Yeah. So First I will actually forego any preparation time. Okay. And okay. in fact, I just want uh, somebody just to grab it and then we will just improvise immediately. Okay. Alright. So but, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm in control now. In the work, I'm quiet. You guys know where that's from? That was a front one to, to push in the last. In the last. <laughs> Which was saying, like, tell me that, and, and Trump is like, quiet. But I actually debated this, but since I knew you were going to entrap me, in moments of, uh, I'm not a religious person, but in moments of uh, stress and uh, confusion and uncertainty, we all want to seek solace and we all want to seek some place or something that gives us, us guidance. And uh, I am going to have to ask, actually, you. <laughs> so you're going to help me. Uh, because my book of uh, guidance is uh, <laughs> <laughs> the lyrics of the uh, wise Taylor Swift. And uh, what we're going to do is please open it whenever you want to, and you give it to me. You're going to okay. stay here okay. with me. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to open it, and you give it to me. And I'm going to read a little bit of the words. And then we're going to see the topic and open the first. And uh, Taylor is going to help us get it to the next level. <laughs> because whatever it is that we want to learn, there's going to be a very basic interpretation. It's going to be wrong. We have to listen to Taylor. Okay. So uh, just to open anywhere. OK. I wish you would. Moderately fast. <laughs> Pay attention to this issue. We're hearing Taylor. It's 2 a.m. in your car. Windows down, you pass my street. The memories start. You say it's in the past and drive straight ahead. Get the topic then. That'll just Actually, in a, in a brief change of uh, events, you're going to be doing topic number eight. This is just too easy. Taylor Swift's blank space. More full of CIA files than you might expect. <laughs> For the record, I don't know any Taylor Swift song other than shake it up and have a good excuse. Because my goddaughter last semester was just shake it up every second. It's a good song. Give me a second. Sorry. Well, luckily for him, it's one of the first things we have to It's okay. This is actually Philip's first museum computer, so he's a little new to it. Three different songs that she wrote and how they came to be. So, I feel like I've got some of the help. Oh, don't try, just really, anything, anything. You know what, I got it, just for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this time, or do I pass them? Yeah, you can. Uh, we can okay. have somebody yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, great. More than okay. So, um, we're going to start your 10-minute timer. Perfect. Right. Can you tell me when next time? Give me a first light. Oh, okay. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> See, we think that this is about Taylor, but what you don't know is that her quantum physics background allows her to travel through time. When she says 2 a.m., she literally means... See, this is one of those things that you think it's allegorical. It's literal. 
You have to know when you have to read Taylor literally and when you have to interpret her. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> well, this is German. And <laughs> Using my extensive knowledge because of my Canadian background, I'm quite fluent in German. This indicates... Where's Mike? <laughs> I didn't tell you the word. I need Taylor's help. Sorry. Think of Taylor, think of what you're seeing. This love is good. This love is bad. This love is alive. Back from the dead. Oh. <laughs> it couldn't be clearer. <laughs> I mean, the connections are there. It, it should be chilling. Clearly, she's trying to tell us that we have to go beyond life and death to understand her language. She cannot write what she does just in her CV. In fact, the next slide should make that clear. <laughs> Terror and democracy. What words could be better connected to the state of science and physics at this point? <laughs> no, no, this is hard. I know you. I know we're all confused. And remember, we've gone through eigenvalues, eigenvectors, transformations. <laughs> Look, this has led to this moment. You, we are a community. We are all learning together. It is hard to understand the word of Taylor. It is very difficult. But. I'm not the only one to do it. We are going to do it together. So, terror is only justice, prompt, severe, and inflexible. It is then an emanation of virtue. This love is good, this love is bad. <laughs> the yin and the yang, <laughs> democracy, capitalism, Communism. <laughs> Next slide. Oh. <laughs> I like the CIA. Where's my? See, you would think that this is about Taylor and the fact that she has been part of the CIA. Um, she actually, she's, she doesn't have a file at the CIA. She's actually an agent since conception. <laughs> but in reality, what it means is, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> so is she really part of the CIA? What does that tell you? Looking at it now, come on, looking at it now, it all seems so simple. We were lying on your couch. I remember you took a Polaroid of us. <laughs> Polaroid, Polaroid, CIA, Polaroid. <laughs> then discovered Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> then discovered the rest of the world was black and white. So really, That is not Taylor. That is the agent. And you think it's Taylor, but that's because you're thinking in black and white. 
identities are not limited, and Taylor is not just Taylor. Taylor is every one of us. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> I do know, because of that woman, that she's not the one that gets angry at the people. It's another one. I don't know who else it is, but it's another one. It was all the way through the summer. But that's the first thing that came to my mind. Ergo, it must be false. We have to. Again, what is the word of Taylor? Oh. Finds out her CIA was cheating on her. Clean. The drought was the very worst. Ah. Ah. When the flowers that we've grown together died of thirst. It was months and months of back and forth. Ah, ah. Really? See, Taylor is just opening bare her soul for us to see. Her thirst, her pain over the CIA. You don't know it because you're not Canadian. <laughs> but if you were Canadian like me, and if you knew German like I know, <laughs> you would know how to get angry when you have to express that the flowers that we've grown together died of thirst. <coughs> Next slide. Oh my God! <laughs> That's the thing. What is happening? I want to read. I just don't know what it is. I have to read. <laughs> you give me everything and nothing. This mad, mad love makes you come running to stand back where you stood. I wish you would. I wish you would. I wish you would. I wish you would. I. I, I wish, I wish, I. So clearly the message there, 30 seconds, is that there's a lot of eyes. <laughs> and it is the number of eyes and her open eyes that make the clear connection as to the true nature of what we have to understand about ourselves because we are Taylor and Taylor is us. This is not the end, this is just the beginning. Thank you for sharing this time with me, for going into my pain and Taylor's pain. I hope we will continue this conversation together.
Okay, that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do eight minutes and then do two minutes for question and answer. Okay, if, that, if sounds, you have time. that sounds great. Okay. All right, so thank you all for coming here today. I'm really excited to see all of you here. I know you've come a long way to spend time with me today and learn about this. And it's something I know, it, it, it's something I've wondered about for a long time. And I think every one of you in the audience, I'm sure, has wondered about this too. So the question is posed here for you very clearly on this slide. How is it that shelving systems actually change the course of the Industrial Revolution? We all know about the steam engine. Right? We all know about the internal combustion engine. We all know even about the island hook, but shelving systems? Have we thought deeply about how shelving systems actually have impacted each of our lives deeply? I mean, look, first of all, before we even take a step back, historically, I'd like everyone to just take a moment, close your eyes, okay? And when you open your eyes, what I'd like you to do is look around the room slowly, and each time you see a shelf, just, just shout out, shelf. <laughs> and close your eyes, all right, we're all open now, and let's look, look around the room. Shelf, 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 It's amazing. Like, take a moment just to reflect on what just happened. We all have suddenly come to realize the importance and the centrality of shelves in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I propose that most of us each day walk through this space and we don't say shelf once. <laughs> we don't even recognize that there are shelves here because shelves are so integral to what it is to be human. So if we can now go to the next slide, I want to take you back in time now. So join me, we're going to get in the time machine, we'll turn around a few times, and we'll open our eyes at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. It's some time in the past that I do not have any flipping clue today. But it's a time when men were men, and girls were girls, and steam engines ran the world. And here's a picture of that time. Notice something really important here. You can see that there are large pieces of equipment here. You can see over here there's a ladder, which you might think is a shelf, but it's not. <laughs> Ladders are not shelves. If you look very closely, you'll see floors, you'll see a, a, a sort of gantry there that crosses. What do you not see in this picture? Shelves. And indeed, had we remained at this state, Men still would be men, and girls still would be girls. We would not have achieved the level of sort of social growth that we've seen over the last century. We would not have achieved the level of education we've achieved over the last century. We would not be on the trajectory that we are forward to achieving the UN Millennium Development Goals. None of those things would have happened were it not for the next slide. <laughs> the addition sign, <laughs> which gives you some idea of what might be coming next. What do you think the next slide is going to be? Um, I sure as hell. <laughs> so can I have the next slide? There it is. It's the industrial shelving unit. Take a moment, if you would, just to, to observe the lines of this particular piece of furniture. Notice how they are vertical and also horizontal. <laughs> they intersect beautifully at 90 degree angles, affording us with not one, not two, not three, not four, but five different surfaces upon which we can store anything that our heart desires. This, in fact, is design embodied. This is beauty that you're looking at. And it's a beauty that's enabled us as a society to do things that we never thought were possible. I, let me take just a moment to tell you a story that's from my own childhood. So there was a time when I was young, and I knew nothing of the world. And I went, I had never seen a shelf before, I had never read a book before, I went, I went to school, and at school they had these amazing things called shelves. And there were these books upon the shelves, but what was really interesting to me were the shelves. <laughs> because the shelves were really the repository of knowledge upon which that knowledge rested. Right? It, was the, it, it was like Atlas holding up the world for me. And as I took each of those books from my sh those shelves and filled my mind with, with all of the accumulated knowledge of humankind, which is why I get to stand up here and tell you all of this crap, <laughs> um, something happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> 
and so I think I'll go on to the next slide. So where are we today? We, we, we've sort of taken our time to get from the Industrial Revolution to where we stand today. The world stands in front of us, and the question I'd like to ask you next is, is what's next for us from a shelving perspective? I think we've started to see some really interesting innovations happening in, in shelving, so if you can go to the next slide. I propose that we are really at, at a crossroads in our history from a shelving perspective, that there is an exit on the freeway of life ahead for us that's labeled opportunity. And that exit is an opportunity that has to do with reimagining the shelf for the 21st century. Now, here at Olin College, we've already begun to do that. <laughs> and if you look around the room, you'll see evidence of that. For example, you'll note these shelves with colorful panels <laughs> inside, which are not just colorful, but are in fact in the library palette. You'll also notice they have casters. There are not many shelves in the world that have casters. These shelves have casters, and that opens a whole new world of possibilities because suddenly the shelf is no longer fixed in place, but in fact can move through the universe. <laughs> so I think there are really exciting opportunities for all of us in shelves in the future. I hope that all of you will take the opportunity to afford yourself uh, Take advantage of the opportunity to afford yourself of learning more about shelves and engaging with shelves as we take shelves from the Industrial Revolution to the technology revolution that's currently underway to the next revolution, the ASAMU, the shelving revolution. <laughs>
there really is not evidence of use of horizontal storage services in any of those cultures. <laughs> I've, I've seen a number of those documentaries, and frankly, it's a bunch of problems. Well, you are the expert. <laughs> you will have eight, eight minutes to tell us about uh, all about avocados, and then we'll have a two minute quick question and answer session. Okay. All right. Take it away. So I'll is their history. Mm. So today I'm going to be telling you about how they come from Central and South America and how they were very significant to these areas in an area in a way you may not expect. We're going to start with the origin of the word avocado. Um, it is it's an Aztec word which escapes me, but it translate to, translates to, this is completely true, testicle tree. <laughs> See, Avocados were believed to be such a powerful aphrodisiac with their very rotund, hair-like shape and intense, creamy center that when they were in season, cultures of the area would lock up their virgins for months to make sure that they would not fall pregnant because the avocados were just too overpowering. So, we started to get into conquistador era. Now, it took ages and ages for the Aztecs to be consumed by conquistadors as like the, a lot of stuff went down. Because of course they're powerful warriors with really interesting gods that are entirely terrifying and they had lots of really interesting, everybody hated them so that's probably the reason why you think it would be, but it's not. It's because it took so long because of the fact that <laughs> avocados were too powerful for the conquistadors. So what they would do is that on battle lines, they would just show up, they'd, put on, they'd bring baskets and baskets of avocados to the lines and they'd set them out in front of the conquistadors and they come up with all their metal and armor and then they see these rotund, very sexual looking fruits <laughs> <laughs> with their creamy meats and nutty center and they get confused. So they've never seen this fruit before, but they start to feel compelled. So what they do is they decide that they're going to cut it open, they're going to see <coughs> it inside, and then they see the creamy green and then they taste it. And it's an orgasm in their mouth and they are completely incapacitated. And one of them, so the first guy who looks, one of the captains, he eats it, he takes a bite of the flesh and you just see his face explode with pleasure. And everybody else is like, I gotta get in on this. <laughs> so <laughs> you start seeing battalion upon battalion of people coming to conquer us an entire civilization completely distracted by the pleasure that is one that is entirely fresh, perfectly in season avocados. Literally better than sex, or equivalent to sex, allegedly, according to this culture. Very, very powerful weapon. So eventually, they've engorged themselves on avocados for days now. They just keep bringing them out, bringing them out. They basically can use them as pets now. So you can see like conquistadors running around, you can see locals like with a basket of avocados, just like making them do their busy work, making them move things, and just like, we'll give you an avocado, and they're just like, okay. So this is, this is some pretty interesting stuff. It goes on about, it goes on like this for about 50 years. Really quite sad. And we don't think that anybody is going to keep them, from, is going to stop them. I mean, it's an excellent source. Everybody's happy. It's basically like having a bunch of meth addicts that aren't entirely dead, and in fact are eating a superfood doing all your work for you. It's really great. <laughs> it's really great. However, one day, they've been eating so many avocados that they start to turn green. Gradually, generations of these former conquistadors are turning green, and they start to fall sick, and they start to get like thick, leathery green skin because of how many avocados they're eating. So they're gradually anamorphing into avocados. <laughs> and 
It's been a while since they've been heard from, from Spain and Portugal. So another party comes back, and they start looking for them. And they see these mutant monsters that look like these deformed fruits that are also very, very sexually attractive. They don't understand why. But they do know that they used to be the conquistadors. So they are rather concerned. So what they do is they become inc entirely averse to using these incredibly sexy yet menacing avocado human monsters and the avocados that created them. So they come in and they decide that they are going to slaughter the avocado slave people monsters. And it's an entire bloodbath. And the entire uh, former avocado slave population becomes, it goes from this to uh, this. <laughs> Guacamole. <laughs> and thus, that's why Chipotle is so darn good. It's because, <laughs> it's, it's because of this guacamole that is descended from the bloodbath of avocado human monsters that were so intertwined, the epitome of the avocado. So, Ch Chipotle is the reason that people don't want to go to Chipotle right now is people found this out. So, they have found the slave camps where they're gradually morphing people into avocado people and then creaming them and turning them into guacamole. It's genocide. It's really not okay. So yeah, don't go to Chipotle. It's, it's really not hygienic. It's, it's pretty sad. But it does taste really, really flipping good. So, I mean, it's, it's your choice. It's your choice. You could always just not get guac. It does cost extra. <laughs> Now we'll have a, a brief question and answer session. Then we'll have a question um, about the history of avocados. Anyone? Yeah, we got. Yeah. Uh, what does Chipotle do with the avocado pits? Okay, so the avocado pits are used to seed the next batch of people. <laughs> so inside the avocado pits are a. Uh, this is another reason why you shouldn't go to Chipotle. It's it's kind of like um like a you know test tube babies except inside avocado pits, and then they there's there's some pretty nasty stuff that goes down with trying to make avocado people. It's uh, the Catholic Church does not support it. It's, um, <laughs> it's it's pretty sketch. Do not recommend. It's pretty unethical. Do you have a one more question? Do I even want to know where, where uh, salsa comes from? Well, you know, they are people, so they still have blood. So, uh, <laughs> they mix, they grow tomatoes hydroponically using that, so that's that's the spice that you get. That's, that's what salsa comes from. Yep. Where could I get a large quantity of avocados? Mainly prehistoric avocados? Prehistoric avocados. <laughs> Um, you could go to Central America. You could also go to the um, Chipotle Research Center in uh, Area 51. They've um, we've got some pretty experimental tests with trying to uh, experiment with um, like thousands of year old uh, strains of avocados and see how that works for making avocado people. Yep. What does guacamole mean? Guacamole means Cries of this enslaved innocent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to be talking uh, to you guys today about a character, a person that many of you know, many of you are familiar with. Um, uh, his name's up on up there. He sort of has the same mythical status as people like Christopher Columbus, you know, uh, Aristotle, uh, all these famous historical characters you may have heard about, learned about, even heard from when you were in elementary school. But a lot of what you know about these characters is actually wrong. In particular, Bill Nye, the science guy, someone that you all know, that you've all heard from. Um, in his famous indoctrination videos, 
shown to students all across the country in America's youth indoctrination camps. Um, many of you have been to it, in fact, whether or not you know about it. Um, it has a deep uh, and abiding connection to the Illuminati. Um, so if you'd like to go to the next slide, um, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of subliminal messaging that you may not have uh, picked up on when watching episodes of Bill Nye the Science Guy. Uh, as a young child. Does anyone remember any episodes of Bill Nye the Science Guy? You may have watched. Any, what, what kind of topics does he talk about? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Digestion. Digestion. Anything else? The weather. The weather. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, right? Gravity. Gravity. Uh, these are all purport to be scientific topics, but actually, the true purpose of these videos is to uh, infect your mind, actually, with subliminal messages relating to the Illuminati and your ultimate true purpose on this world. Um, so Digestion is a perfect example of one of his uh, more famous videos. Um, so in Digestion, Bill and I purports to be talking about the process that food goes through uh, between your mouth and when you poop it out. <laughs> An important and fascinating topic. But actually, much of the science behind this episode is false and wrong. And it's designed to get you to think that the food that you're eating is nutritious, is nutritional, and will actually, uh, will actually grow your body to be strong and your mind to be strong and powerful. Uh, when in fact, he's trying to divert the diet of the majority of Americans uh, to weaker foods such as hot dogs, American cheese, uh, and burgers, um, which, which serve the ultimate purpose of the Illuminati, of, uh, of defeating our minds. Um, you'll hit the next slide. Um, uh, this is a classic um, from Bill Nye's Night of Nye, a uh, rock special that was shown on, uh, on HBO. Uh, this is a late night special, so many of you may not have seen it. Though. But this is an example of Bill Nye's lesser known attempt to connect with a more adult audience. Uh, because uh, while indoctrinating the children in America is a valuable technique, and something that's used quite heavily by the Illuminati. Um, the uh, ultimate plan to use regulation against global warming to overthrow America in the next five to 10 years will require that the adults in America also, uh, also have some level, at least, of moderate indoctrination. Um, so, uh, so you can see uh, triangles are a common motif in these videos um, that, he, that he produces. Um, You'll hit the next, is there a next slide? Um, I don't actually know. There's no next slide. And the extreme use of triangles actually serves uh, to confuse your brain wiring um, and, and change the way that your brain is wired out. Um, and so I know that a lot of this is very confusing. You might feel like you're actually listening to Oscar talk. Right. Now, right? <laughs> uh, but but I promise you that it's true. And if you weren't able to understand Oscar's highly convincing and coordinated talk from earlier tonight, it's probably because you watched too much Bill Nye. <laughs> um, so I would be happy to take uh, any questions that you guys have at this point. I think we're all pretty familiar with the Bill Nye. Uh, theme song that always plays in the beginning. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. if you could sing that for us and then break it down um, and you know show us where this kind of Illuminati influence is really shown in the Right, absolutely, the absolutely, absolutely. So I think the, the part of the Bill Nye theme song that maybe all of you remember uh, is, is the part uh, where the children shout, Bill, 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 right? And you get into it too, right? You're watching Bill Nye and you're sitting there in your classroom and your teacher is gone, there's a substitute, and you're yelling, Bill, 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 even if it's only in your mind because you're so happy that you got this chance to watch television instead of having to learn about science, right? Um, but actually, when you listen to that section of the track backwards, um, <laughs> it says live, 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 um, which, is, uh, which is a highly powerful Illuminati code word. Um, it's, actually, it's actually the, uh, the now, this is something that they really don't want you to know. This is the word that will be shouted by world leaders and across the radio when it's time for the revolution to come. <laughs> so by getting you to repeat those words over and over and over again in your head, that's actually one of the techniques that they use. Yes. I actually have a question. I've known for a very long time about the agenda of the Illuminati to um, pretend that 
um, you know, climate change is happening so they can advance right. their... Exactly. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, uh, what their plan is to, um, with this giant hoax? Yeah, absolutely. So as, as many of you know, carbon dioxide is, uh, is what we breathe, what, or what we breathe in. Um, so without carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, actually, uh, human beings would go extinct because we wouldn't be able to breathe anything in. Um, and so there's been a massive conspiracy by the Illuminati. This is, I think, the, the deepest part of their conspiracy to convince humans that we actually don't breathe carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide is bad. So the Illuminati have assembled for themselves uh, a section, a, a large stockpile of carbon dioxide creators. So, um, and their plan is ultimately to force the United States government and the government of China, the government of India, to come together and create a trilateral agreement reducing carbon dioxide emissions on this planet down to zero. And in a period of about 10 to 15 years after that happens, the carbon dioxide rates uh, and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will quickly drop below a level where it can sustain human life. Um, and all humans on the planet outside of the Illuminati will be killed. Um, it's a sad story and, and one that you may not have known of uh, if, if you trust it that it's sort of called scientific sources. Uh, <laughs> so we, we now know a little bit about the connection between Bill Nye and the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you, or maybe Oscar can help you out with this, uh, could talk a little bit about the connection between Taylor Swift and the Illuminati. And maybe oh. Bill Nye is, you know, Maybe she could help us. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. she could give us a hand if the yeah. Well, Taylor so Swift, um, Taylor Swift used to be part of the Illuminati when she was much younger. They recruited her from a young age, realizing her sort of magnetic star potential. Um, but something that you may not have known is that after her breakout, the first album, um, she spent a while in a remote cave uh, somewhere in Pakistan. Um, and she emerged uh, having decided that she actually was going to reject the principles of the Illuminati. Um, she, she emerged with the belief that actually humanity was ultimately good. So the song that you may know, We Are Never, 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 Ever, Ever Getting Back Together, um, that was actually written about the Illuminati. <laughs> Something you may not have known. Um, and, uh, and she's she continued the beef uh, in further songs. She's written, for example, Bad Blood, that was a really famous one um, that she wrote recently. Uh, and that many people think that was about a certain West Coast artist, but they're actually uh, entirely off the mark in a hilarious way. Uh, all right. <laughs>